please stand as you are able. I am resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he die. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my waking, he will raise me up and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see and my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother John. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until, by your call, we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. The first reading is from Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, a rich food filled with marrow of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Please join me in reading Psalm 23 together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading is from Revelation. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. 
And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessed and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God, and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat, for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. When my dad died many, many years ago now, I received a sympathy card that said, to live in the hearts that we leave behind 
is not to die. And I really loved that card. I loved that sentiment. I loved it so much that I framed the card and it hung in my room for, or in my home for more than a decade. There was something very comforting about keeping my dad near simply by remembering him. Or at least that's what I thought it meant when I read it at first. But after some years of reading and rereading and seeing it every day, I began to realize that that's not what the card said. It didn't say to be remembered or to be reminisced about or to be thought of from time to time. It said to live in the hearts we leave behind. What did it mean for my dad to continue to live in my heart? That was the question that faced me then. For me, it meant that if I pondered his life and figured out what was most important to him, what his core values were, and then I could decide which of those I might want to incorporate into my own life, into my own way of living. I think that's a pretty easy task when it comes to John Newell. He was a man who truly lived his core values. He wore them on his sleeve for everyone to see. Certainly the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of John is fidelity. Marriage is hard work. It takes commitment and stick to Now, I am not implying that Alessa would be a difficult person to be married to. Far from it. I don't think so at all. But it's just hard to be married to anyone, much less for 71 years. Especially if those years are fragile years. Right, Alessa? I've only known John for not quite three years, but I have a hard time not picturing you two together, coming through that door, with him with your, his arm around you, kind of paving the way for you and making sure that you're safe. Your love for each other was evident to everyone who looked, and it was a gift to everyone who could see. But it's not just that relationship that John used to demonstrate faithfulness. It's in membership in a church for almost as long as the current pastor has been in existence, right? It's about decades-long friendships that weathered through thick and thin. It's about steadfastly caring for our columbarium because his friends and people he knew and cared for rested there after their lives. It's in building the kind of community around himself, family and friends and church folk and co-workers and assorted others, that when you step back and look at that from a distance, it sure does resemble that multitude that could not be counted from every tribe and every nation from our Revelation reading. John, no doubt, is in that great cloud of witnesses right now, and he's already making friends there, and he's already making room for us when we follow someday. You know, when St. James folks talk to me about John, they mention over and over again how kind a person he was. He was, as one parishioner put it, just the nicest guy. There was no pretension about him. He was thoroughly focused on you when he talked to you. Another parishioner put it this way, he he was far more interested in what I had to say than in talking about himself. Now, while I can confirm that, absolutely, I can also tell you it was a bit frustrating for a pastor who calls to see how her parishioner is doing and then hangs up the conversation later, realizing she's just filled John in on a whole lot of stuff and not heard very much about his own situation at all after that conversation. You know, that beautiful passage from Isaiah reminds us, as hard as it is to believe right now, that God will wipe away every tear from our faces. I think this is something John knew down to his bones. Another 
parishioner men mentioned his impish grin and the twinkle in his eye. I had, uh, he had a way of finding fun in anything that he did. Ask Paul and he'll tell you about how John and his brother Tom turned hazelnut harvests from drudgery into a party. Or ask his long-term friends and, and even golf partners how much fun it was to chase a silly ball around a course for a day with John. He was the, his was the kind of humor that had a, a twinkle and a wit about it, often at his own expense. I think my favorite line of his was that he raised filberts but sold hazelnuts. I grew up in Hubbard, so I know exactly what he was talking about there. He was a man after Isaiah's heart. I'm sure he took that, the prophet's promise of a feast of rich foods very seriously. He savored life. He could turn a simple burger lunch out into a sumptuous delight. Paul was right when he said it doesn't get much better than dinner out with, or lunch out with dad. Dinner probably too. But above all, and weaving all of that together, was his spirit of love. The kind of love that Jesus talks about in the gospel reading. The kind of love that doesn't leave anyone out and instead makes sure that each and every person is included and valued and cared for. There was that little chuckle that John loud out every time he answered the phone or, or you greeted him or he came to the back door of the church. I bet you can still hear that little chuckle in your head. Hold on to that, because that was evidence of his utter delight in hearing your voice or seeing your face, in knowing you, in having had the privilege of loving you. And then there was the way he always seemed to have time for anyone that he met. You know, we get busy in life and we get really focused on tasks and trying to get stuff done, get the job done. It's easy to see people who stop by to chat as a distraction from those jobs. But John knew that those distractions, those interruptions, they were the job. He was always glad to see you and always made time to talk with you. Nancy shared a Robert Frost poem called A Time to Talk, and I totally see John in this poem. It goes like this. When a friend calls me to the road and slows his horse to a meaning walk, I don't stand still and look around on the hills I haven't hoed and shout from where I am, what is it? No, not as there is time to talk. I thrust my hoe in the mellow ground blade up and five feet tall, and plod. I go to the stone wall for a friendly visit. John always made time for that friendly visit. You know, our gospel today was from the gospel of John, and a little bit later in that same gospel, Jesus says, I came so that you would have life and have it abundantly. And it's as if our John heard that and said, yeah, thanks. I think I will have me some of that abundant life. And then he went ahead and he married his sweetheart and he loved her for his whole life long. And together they loved a family into existence and taught them how to treasure each other and the time that they had together. And then he wrapped his loving arms around so many people. Those of us in this room are just an inkling of those that he pulled into this abundant life by taking time to listen to each of us, by giving us that twinkling grin or that delighted chuckle, by always choosing to set aside his hoe and come to the stone wall for a friendly chat. I think John understood something at a very profound level, and that is that life is good. That's different from times are good or things are going well for me right now. Deep down, he knew that there was something holy, something God touched, something sacred about life, whether it was how a tree grew or how we honor our dead. 
When you know that, it makes it so easy to show fidelity or humor or friendliness or love to everyone you encounter. And John had that. He had that in spades. I, for one, thank God for John Newell, and I bet you do too. I, for one, want to keep him alive in my heart by embracing this life with faithfulness and kindness and love. I picture John at that great feast smacking his lips and digging in. And I mean to join him there someday. Jesus said that we will, that we get to. Thanks be to God. Amen.
For our brother John, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for John and dry the tears of those who weep. Hear us, Lord. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. Hear us, Lord. You raise the dead to life. Give our brother eternal life. Hear us, Lord. You promise paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Hear us, Lord. Our brother was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. Hear us, Lord. He was nourished with your body and blood. Grant him a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our brother. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Creator of all, we pray to you for John and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May John's soul and the souls of all the departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Amen. Now let us say the words that Jesus taught us to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to the earth we shall return. So, for so you did ordain when you created me, saying, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant John. Acknowledge, we beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And to you, I say, may God give you his comfort and his peace his light and his joy in this world and in the next. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.